you've got more energy coming into the planet than you've got energy going out. That imbalance, you know, is a couple of watts per square meter, which in a, a watt is the amount of energy you've got in a Christmas tree bulb. It's, it's, you, it doesn't even feel warm. It's not, it's not much energy. And the reason you don't get a, a big response in five or ten years is because of the inertia of the climate system. And that, that's a pretty simple concept, although when I said that to uh, some people, that they already were getting lost. But it, the point is that the ocean is four kilometers deep, two and a half miles deep. So it doesn't change quickly when you begin to apply forces to it. And the ice sheets are a few miles thick, so they don't respond quickly as we begin to apply forces to them. And what that means is that the climate change that we can see so far is only, in the case of the, and specifically the global warming that we see so far, which is about eight tenths of a degree Celsius, which is about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, and over land areas it's about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. That's only about half of the warming that we will get due to the gases that are already in the atmosphere just because of this inertia of the system. And that's, that's a pretty simple <clears throat> concept. But in, a, in addition to that inertia, we have inertia in our energy system. So we're not suddenly going to turn off the um, oil burning and the, the fossil fuel burning. Um, and that's the problem. Because if we look at the Earth's history, we can see, we can get a good picture of the eventual response of the system due to a given change in the atmospheric composition. And what we learn from looking at the Earth's history is that there's no way <laughs> that we can burn all the fossil fuels without creating a completely different planet. We would, we would guarantee that we would melt most of the ice on the planet. It, what scientists disagree about is how fast it will happen. And, uh, you know, some argue that, well, sea level change this century is going to be only a meter or so. I think it will be more than that, it, but it, that's a hard nonlinear problem. It's not a collapse of something. It's not something that you can predict the timing of. Uh, rapidly. But it would guarantee that all the, uh, on some time scale, whether it's this century or the next one, that all the coastal cities around the world would be uninhabitable, which would, the economic implications of that are incalculable. So, and there are, there are other, and that's an irreversible effect on any time scale that we can, that humans can uh, think about, as is the extermination of species. And if we continue down this path of burning fossil fuels, we're going to cause the uh, extinction of a substantial fraction of the species on the planet. Um, so, and what, and what, what's uh, tragic about this situation is the fact that the solution to it actually makes more sense and is less painful than continuing down the path that we're on continued burning of all the fossil fuels would guarantee disastrous consequences. But, in fact, continued burning of fossil fuels doesn't make sense because the reason that fossil fuels appear to be the cheapest energy is because they're subsidized and because they don't pay their cost to society. They don't pay for the human health effects of air pollution and water pollution that comes from the burning of fossil fuels and the mining of them, and they don't pay for the costs of climate change. Um, already, they're, it's, they're picked up, all these costs are picked up by the public, either directly in the case of human health or, or indirectly through, or through taxes. Um, when there are disasters, the taxpayers uh, come to the rescue um, and can do that up to a certain point. But, so, as, uh, 
as we heard, there, there is a sensible solution, and that is to gradually increase, place a fee on fossil fuels that you collect from fossil fuel companies at the mine or the port of entry and distribute the money 100% to the public. Because in that way, you would be making the fossil fuels pay their cost to society, and it would provide the incentive for people to reduce their fossil fuel use because that, is not, that fee continues to go up. Fossil fuels are going to get expensive, so you're going to have to figure out alternatives, whether it's energy efficiency or um, alternatives uh, energies. Um, but what we have, and, and this would in fact spur the economy by, uh, it would be a tremendous incentive for entrepreneurs to develop clean energies and energy efficiency and, and sell that to the public. And the people who do better than average in limiting their fossil fuel use would get more in their monthly dividend and uh, that, that would actually work. But there's nobody, and economists that I have talked to agree that that would work. But uh, there's nobody to argue that because it only favors the public. <laughs> and the way, the way our uh, democracy now works, uh, our uh, money is, is driving politics. Uh, and that's true, that's, that, frankly, that's true in both parties. Um, we have one party which says, which is so much under the influence of the fossil fuel industry that they say the whole thing is a hoax. And the other party um, suggests non-solutions. And I'm sorry to say uh, that those non-solutions include the, the fairy tale that windmills and solar panels will, sol will replace all the fossil fuels. They are about 1% or 1.5% and we shouldn't, and so the, uh, so the other party will come up with these fairy tale solutions and force them down your throat by saying you've got to have 30% tell utilities they've got to have 30% of their energy from renewable energies and the public will pay for that because it causes the price of energy to go up. We should not, we don't want politicians deciding on what the best energy sources are. Let the marketplace decide that. So there are, so I, I think frankly that if we're going to get a solution to this in the fairly near term it's going to come from conservatives and there is one, um, George Schultz who was the Secretary of State uh, under Ronald Reagan, who has proposed um, in a speech a couple of weeks ago and in an op-ed that you should have fee and dividend, which is, which is what I've been advocating for the last several years. Because he says that does not make the government bigger. Uh, it lets the marketplace make the decisions. And, um, and but again, uh, you're fighting against very powerful fossil fuel interests. Um, and uh, actually, you know, there are even the Democrats are starting to hear this. So Barbara Boxer and um, Sanders have a bill, but in which it's fee and dividend, except the public is only going to get 60% of the money. Well, that changes the story completely. And that's typical for Democrats. They, they can't keep their hands off the money. <laughs> they want to make the government bigger and, and fund social programs. Um, but the problem with this, if you go 60%, that means most people are going to get less in their dividend than they pay in increased prices. So there's not going to be any drive for this fee to keep going up. If, the way the distribution of energy use now, if you look at that and say we're going to give 100% of the money back to the public, an equal amount to each, legal resident of the country, then 60% of the people would get more in the dividend than they pay in increased prices. <laughs> and when I uh, discussed this in front of uh, Grover Norquist's group, uh, he said, some, one of them said, that's income redistribution. <laughs> well, well, yeah, it is. Uh, the, the 
poorer people will tend to have a better shot at getting more money than they pay on increased prices. But come on, the rich people can't afford uh, to pay. They'll pay more in increased prices because they travel around the world and they have two houses or whatever. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, so uh, I haven't talked much about climate because I, I it, just talking about climate um, doesn't get us to a solution. And that it's, it's uh, what the frustrating thing is that the solution is right there, but it requires politics in the interests of the public. That's why I'm, I'm a in, political independent, and I think we need a third party. Uh, and, I, and I think the third party could get the votes, because remember, a few years back, there was a third party candidate, a little guy from Texas who saw Martians on his front yard, and he got 20% of the vote. <laughs> so, and since then, the public is even more realizes how Washington is screwed up. Um, but um, there was one more thing I was going to say. Um, but um, yeah, we have to uh, somehow get the public informed. And I don't know if this sort of play can help, but it's very hard to make people aware of what the situation is. So, by the way, the one organization that I think um, that I support most strongly is Citizens Climate Lobby because they're, they're now, they're taking as their number one goal a, a fee and dividend and they're writing op-eds and they're talking to Congress people and, um, but, um, but still, we're, we're a small, um, the number of people who understand the situation is small. And um, we've got to um, change that pretty quickly because uh, we can't afford to burn all the fossil fuels. And especially it, the, the fact that we would consider I, I couldn't imagine, when I wrote my first major paper on this in 1981, and I, we showed actually at that time, we can't burn all the coal, and it makes no sense to consider going after unconventional fossil fuels like tar sands and tar shale. And I just assumed that as the climate change, reality of climate change became apparent, that governments would take account of that. But here we have a government which looks like it's about to approve the tar sands pipeline. That pipeline, then it takes a, a, you have to use a lot of energy to get that gook out of the ground. And then you have to refine it. And it, that takes more energy. And you're doing a tremendous damage to the, the regional climate in um, the regional um, environment in Canada. Uh, it's very analogous to the situation in the movie um, uh, with the green, with the blue people, but uh, where where governments were uh, anyway. Avatar. Avatar, yeah. In fact, the Avatar scenes were based in part on on uh, <laughs> photographs of the uh, of the tar sands area. It's so it's so awful looking. Uh, but, um, darn, I was going to say something. Uh, pardon? Um, oh, so oh, the, the pipeline. That, for, it looks like uh, it, our president might approve that. Now, what, what, we've shown with economic modeling is that if you put a $10 a ton tax on CO2 going up $10 a ton per year, at the end of 10 years that's $100 and it's equivalent to a dollar a gallon on gasoline, but it's, so it's increasing your costs, but it would be yielding between two and $3,000 per legal resident of the country. And so they would have the money to pay that increased cost. 
And the effect of that would be to reduce our carbon, uh, our fossil fuel use 30%. That is 11 times more than the volume that will be carried by that huge pipeline. So it, it, <laughs> it just shows how senseless that pipeline is as in comparison to a sensible policy. And yet we can't get politicians to consider a sensible policy. That's where we stand, and people had better start understanding this pretty soon, or we will have passed tipping points, and our children and grandchildren will get impacts which they cannot control. This, that allows me to testify against the government in the, our children's trust is filing and has filed some legal actions against the federal government for not doing its job of protecting the rights of young people and also similar cases in uh, state governments and and there are other cases such as attempts to block expanded coal exports from the west coast and the tar sands pipelines and things and I will participate in those but in all of these my uh, potential contribution depends upon the science so in fact I, 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 I will be spending most of my time continuing to do science because we I have to be on top of that to effectively participate in these things. And the truth is things like the, the, the courts are an alternative to this dysfunctional Washington, but the courts seldom get far out in front of the public opinion. In the case of civil rights, the courts were eventually helpful in telling the government you have to desegregate schools, for example. But that was after the, the public had become uh, clearly opposed to the uh, violations of civil rights. And so we do need to get the public to be understand the situation. Okay, questions? What, what do you think about the new FEMA uh, 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 maps and their, their predictions coming? Uh, what do you think uh, they could be wildly off? Uh, you know, we saw previously, like, nobody contemplating seven-foot surges. You know, Sandy was 14-foot double. Could we contemplate in 20, 30 years double, triple those type surges? Uh, uh, probably not, no. Uh, the the time scale for, um, for ice sheet disintegration is... Um, is up in the air. Now, I, this last summer, the melt from Greenland is almost certainly a record based on, and it, it, had, it had been uh, increasing quite rapidly over the 10 years that we've had this precise data from the gravity satellite, which measures the gravitational field so accurately that you can see the changes in the mass of that ice sheet. And uh, you could fit the way the, way the, the mass loss is accelerating, you can fit with a doubling time of something between five and ten years, which means potentially by the middle of the century you're going to be getting substantial uh, rises in sea level. But it could be the end of the century. But it's not ten years from now, it's not fifteen years from now. The ice sheet d don't change that quickly, but as I say, the mass loss is accelerating. and the. Physics is that we're putting heat into the ocean now. So the ocean is, is gaining heat. And if we allow that to go far enough, it guarantees that the ice shelves will melt. Those are the tongues of ice that come out from Antarctica and Greenland into the ocean. And it will take time, but we can see those are already uh, melting back quite rapidly. So if we let the ocean warm up a degree Celsius or so, it guarantees. We know from the Earth's history, from the last interglacial period, that sea level was six to eight meters higher then, with uh, a global temperature that was about two degrees warmer than pre-industrial, about one degree warmer than today. We, we know that sea level is going to go up. We can't say exactly how fast. It's not going to be in the next 10 or 20 years, but it will be in the lifetime of our children and grandchildren if we stay on this business as usual course. Why has the environmental 
throbbing, I guess, been unable to reset the uh, Keystone Pipeline argument in the way that you presented it. Why are there no pictures of the damage that's being done up there? Why is there no talk of the damage that the tar sands oil is going to put? Not in the spill, though there might be terrible damage to that too, depending where it is, but that's not the point. It, it, what they're saying is, oh, it's jobs and stimulate the economy, and they're worried about a spill. We're not worried about a spill. We're worried about burning the stuff. Why can't we get that message out there? Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate because the the number of jobs is actually relatively small associated with that and it's sh they're short term and that's the way our politics has become it's become very short term not looking at what is in our best interests on the long run because what we need is honest pri in order to make our economy most efficient we need honest pricing and if we did that we would we would drive the uh, the building of of new technologies and energy sources and energy efficiency, which would we could sell to the rest of the world. Instead, we're becoming more like an oil producing uh, country, which short term gets some quick money but on the long run is making us less competitive. So it re requires politicians who will stand up and tell the truth. Uh, and that seems to be hard to come by. And it's really a shame because if, when the President Obama was elected in 2008, if he had, if he had leveled with the people and say we need to, we need to put a price on carbon and and let that increase and it's going to require some changes uh, you know he could have made the public understand that i think but uh he did not choose to do that he put his priorities elsewhere the u.n organization the UNFCCC, i think it is it said that um uh, two degrees c is the limit um beyond which you know we could be tipping point my question is, are you on board with that consensus of the two-degree As I mentioned a moment ago, I'm really, we'll be focusing on the science and on papers, but we submitted a paper a week ago called Scientific Prescription, it's not the exact title, but for stabilizing climate for the sake of young people and nature. What we show is that Two degrees Celsius, that's the temperature of the Eemian, the last interglacial period 120,000 years ago, which had sea level rise of at least six meters. Um, and we can already see with the, with the warming of eight-tenths of a degree that we're already loading the climate dice in a way that has significant implications. But if we go 150% more than that, we will, we will get even much uh, larger effects. So the, uh, the safe level is to keep our climate close to the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years, um, which is still barely possible. What we show in the, and this paper is the, used as the basis for the, the legal cases filed by Our Children's Trust. But in order to stabilize things this century, we would need to reduce emissions 6% a year, and we would need to, um, to reforest some of the deforested areas. Uh, it's, so that's a, a very stiff prescription. Uh, but that would actually get us back to 350 ppm of CO2. Uh, but something like that is actually the sa uh, what is needed, or something very close to it, as opposed to this two degree C. The two degree C is simply, and what they believe is feasible. They, that's the thousand gigatons of carbon. Right. So far, we've burned 370 gigatons of carbon. Uh, fossil fuels. To stay close to the Holocene, the limit should be about 500. 
that's just barely possible. That would require that we realize that we can't burn all the fossil fuels. So unfortunately, the two degrees C and a thousand gigatons carbon is going to cause us to then have to suck some CO2 out of the atmosphere, which will be very expensive. So we're leaving that burden for our children and grandchildren because once, once we see things happening and we have any hope of keeping the remarkable planet that we have and the life on it, people are going to say, well, <laughs> we do really have to do something. And that's, that's going to be hard yeah, if we don't get on a different path quickly. Between the believers and the non-believers of global warming, the, the, uh, the politics of oil, gas, and coal, to, to say that a tax could solve the problem in today's world where everything is done at the point of crisis, I, I think that to say a tax will solve the problem will never get the public there. There has to be a solution, whether it's nuclear or fusion or something to that extent, and, and I'm not hearing that. You do need uh, technological solutions because, as I mentioned, the so-called renewables, the, which some people, some of the utility people call the unreliables because they're not there all the time. Sometimes the sun is shining and sometimes it's not, and sometimes the wind is blowing and sometimes it's not. So if, if you use those as a substantial portion of your power, you back them up with gas, and that means fracking. We need uh, technological solutions, and they are possible. You need to have this base of a rising fee on carbon in order to stimulate those alternatives. And in my opinion, only thing that's on the horizon that we know of now as a baseload electric power other than fossil fuels and the relatively small amount you can get from hydropower is uh, nuclear power. And, but there's such a strong religion that's developed against nuclear power and it's all directed against old nuclear power, 50 year old technology, while there is the potential for fourth generation nuclear power, which instead of burning 1% of the energy in the fuel, it burns more than 99%. So the waste is much smaller and it has a half-life in decades instead of thousands of years. That's, a, that's a one candidate. Some places will choose not to have nuclear power and that's fine, but places like China and India, I don't see how we're going to get them off coal except by advanced, safer nuclear power. And unfortunately, the U.S. still has the best brain power in that field, and we're not willing to share it with, with uh, other countries like China and India. They're, they're attempting to develop uh, advanced generation nuclear power, but they're, um, they're not going as fast as they could. It takes hours to discuss that, and um, but, but we did just publish a paper showing how many lives have been saved by nuclear power because it has partially replaced fossil fuels, which are killing about a million people a year from the air and water pollution. Uh, but but I'm not, I don't want to f force nuclear power on anybody, but that's one of the alternatives. And if you put a price on carbon, let it rise and let the alternatives compete. And if uh, people who think the sun and wind can do the job are right, then, then they can win that competition. I have a question. I, I, I read this New York, article, New York Times article uh, about your retirement. And one of the things written there was that uh, some of your colleagues, or most, or many, uh, think that sometimes your um, explanation of risks goes too far mm -hmm. in their minds. Uh, and I was, I was curious, why is that not the case in your mind? And um, if you are truly an outlier, why is that so? And why are there not more scientists that you know, look for the boundaries of the and show them? Yeah, you know, uh, Bill Gates, who he says Jim Hansen exaggerates, and he thinks that's a problem. 
I'm actually writing uh, something for my email distribution at the moment, which I'll have done in the next day or so. Uh, unfortunately, I wish you were right. But unfortunately, um, that's not the case. Um, and uh, <laughs> I also... Uh, Uh, yeah, so, so in, in what I'm writing, I first have a section on exaggeration, and then I have an a section on jumping the gun, which uh, that's really what some of my colleagues accuse me of. They say, you're willing to say, so you're saying something before we're ready to say it. And that was, was said in 1988 and 1989 when I testified, and there was this big meeting for five-day meeting in which most of the science were criticizing me, but it was, it was reported nicely by uh, Dick Kerr in Science Magazine. It was titled, Hansen Versus the World on Global Warming. And, uh, and he, one of the scientists said, if there was a secret ballot, most of us would agree. <laughs> that, uh, so, but, but, but we don't like this guy going out and saying this before we're ready to say it. And uh, again, and it's a similar situation, you know. So I was just two weeks ago at a meeting with about twenty really included top scientists in the field. Not one of them now disagrees that because of the inertia of the system, because the warming that we're putting in the ocean is going to stay there for many centuries, and because the carbon dioxide that we put in the system by burning fossil fuels is going to stay in the surface climate system for millennia, it guarantees that we cannot burn many more fossil fuels. So the whole point of the meeting is geoengineering. How can we solve this? <laughs> There's absolutely not one of them disagreeing that uh, this is going to be consequences which cannot be accepted. So um, I don't, so the impression that, uh, that I'm a part of that impression comes because of what I wrote an article called Scientific Reticence. There are, it's, skepticism is the lifeblood of science. You always are skeptical and, and, quest, and question your conclusions repeatedly. Uh, but there, and there are various factors which make this reticence uh, more powerful than it should be. Uh, and um, as I say, I wish it were true that I were exaggerating. But unfortunately, um, I think the evidence does not support that. And as I say, I have a few papers uh, that are in one of them, one major one is in press at the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which is the world's oldest journal. And I think it will make, it makes very clear that um, I'm not exaggerating. When you, it, this is based primarily on paleoclimate evidence, which shows that the system is actually more sensitive than the models uh, suggest. And that means that um, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs>